House of Ed Tech, Episode 47. Hey, this is Tom Murray from the Alliance for Excellent Education, and you are listening to the House of Ed Tech with Chris Nessie. Support for this episode comes from HelpHub.me, the Internet's premier online tutoring marketplace, and Audible.com. With over 180,000 titles available, you can get two free audiobook downloads. To take advantage of both of these, visit ChrisNessie.com and click on the banner links on the side. Welcome to the House of Ed Tech podcast. I am your host, Christopher Nessie, and the House of Ed Tech explores how technology is changing the way teachers teach and the impact that technology is having in education. We discuss technology that is changing our classrooms and our schools. We share tools, tips, and resources that you can hear about today and use tomorrow. I talk to teachers, leaders, and creators like you and have them share their stories. Because whether you use it or not, technology is changing the way we teach and how our students learn. Coming up in this episode of the House of Ed Tech, I've got my Ed Tech thought, Ed Tech recommendation, a House of Ed Tech VIP, and the reason you're all here, this episode I am talking to Matt Miller. That's right, the ditch that textbook guy. Can't wait to share that conversation coming up in just a few minutes. But first, a couple of announcements here to start the episode. Uh, some good news on my professional front. I have a new job. Not a completely brand new job. I still have my original, my quote unquote, my day job. But beginning in January of 2016, I can add university adjunct professor to my resume. That's right. I'm going to be teaching at the college level. I picked up a course in the School of Communication at Rutgers University, where I'll be teaching a course titled Leadership in a Digital Context. And I'd like to give a huge shout out to Dr. Mary Chaco for the opportunity to teach at this level and teach in an environment that I've only ever been a student in. So this is very exciting, and I'm looking forward to keeping you posted as to what happens as I go through the spring semester as a teacher. So that's very exciting. Also, in this episode, I'm going to be changing up the format just a little bit. So if you've been a longtime listener, things will appear to be out of order, but I'm experimenting with the show, so we're going to see what happens. So the uh, the lineup for this episode is going to be this little bit of banter and some updates. Then I'm going to go into the EdTech thought, my EdTech recommendation. Then I'll be sharing the conversation with Matt Miller. And then I will announce this episode's House of Ed Tech VIP. Let me know what you think as I change it up here a little bit in this episode number 47. Also, we're getting close to the end of 2015, which means that we're getting near the end of year number two of the podcast. And that means it's time for the second annual House of Ed Tech App Smackdown. I had a huge amount of fun last year putting together episode number 26 and sharing 26 awesome tech tools, tips, and recommendations that were submitted by you. I want you to start to prepare what you want to share this year. If you're a new listener, I really recommend that you go back and check out episode number 26 if you haven't listened to that one already. And this year, I have one rule, and that's no repeats from last year. Rack your brains a little bit and prepare to send me some audio through the SpeakPipe button on chrisnessy.com, or you can send a message on Voxer, a Mr. Nessie on Voxer, or you can also call the House of EdTech feedback hotline. Be sure to include your name, your Twitter handle, your website, and to promote where you are online, and then share your recommendation in 60 seconds or less. Now, it's not really a race, so take your time. If you would like to submit multiple entries, that is totally acceptable. Just submit separate files, and please get your audio file to me no later than November 30th of 2015, and these will be shared in my last episode of 2015 coming up in December. I look forward to hearing all the awesome submissions and putting together that episode to wrap up 2015. And now, and this is a little different, let's go to my EdTech thought, and let's bring in my special guest, which is like a bonus guest. 
Miss Jill Dobrowanski. All right, joining me now through the power of Google Hangouts, Jill Dobrowanski. As you may recall, she's a former, and I don't even like to say former, she is a House of EdTech VIP. She's the director of curriculum for Wall Township Public Schools here in Jersey. And I'm bringing Jill on here real quick to talk about her experiences at the recent Edscape conference, which took place at Woodbridge High School. And if you're not familiar with Edscape, this conference is the former brainchild of nationally and actually world-renowned principal Eric Scheninger. Jill Dobrowanski, welcome to the House of Ed Tech, and let's talk about Edscape. Hey, thanks for having me, Chris. I'm very excited to be here. I am very excited to have you. I know you listened to the program, and we, we met over the summer at Wall, where I got to experience some good times with you and Rich Kiker, also a former guest of the program, and got to learn googly stuff. So this is very exciting to have you here now, too. So tell me about Edscape. Initial reactions, Go. It was great. It was uh, my first time attending an Edscape conference, and I also had the opportunity to present at one, uh, during one of the sessions. So I was extremely excited to be there. My initial reaction was that it's always energizing to be around like-minded educators and at all different levels. I, I've met teachers, principals, assistant principals, all the way up to some very famous uh, New Jersey superintendents <laughs> and had some time to have some really rich, deep, meaningful conversations with them. So who was the, in your mind, who was the coolest person that you met on that Saturday? Uh, it was probably the keynote speaker, Perniel Rip. I had never really heard of Perniel before attending Edscape. But just to hear her speak and to have her tell her story was very invigorating and really reminded us why we do what we do every day. And I was lucky enough for that. I had the opportunity to spend some time with her for a few minutes after her speech. And uh, she is as authentic as it gets. That's what makes for good education, authenticity. Uh, whether you're a teacher or an administrator, you know, to be real. And ultimately, that that's what's going to benefit our kids. What was your big takeaway from getting the opportunity to chat with her a little bit one-on-one -on -one or in that small group setting? My biggest takeaway was to always remember why we do what we do. Um, sometimes we get lost in the minutia and the mandates. And as long as we can always keep the kids' voice um, center and focused and really guiding every decision we make, then it is the best thing for kids in the end. Now, you also presented during the conference. What was your presentation about? My presentation was about something we started in district last year, which is called Innovation Day. And what that is, is that's one day where all four of our elementary schools grades K through five, stopped what they were doing, and kids were given the opportunity to investigate and create solutions to everyday world problems. I'd like you to expand on that a little bit more because that sounds, at face value, very cool. But what makes that really cool? What are some of the things that you've seen that made you want to even present on this topic? Some of the things that we saw and heard from the kids was that you know, they had the opportunity to think about and think, for lack of a better term, outside the box about problems that they really would have never thought of. So, for example, our um, first grade students were given a challenge to build a better igloo where the ice cube uh, penguin could survive the longest in. And we gave uh, the students just different types of recyclable materials and an iPad, and they were off and running, and they created some great, amazing things. So how long did the penguin survive? The longest <laughs> penguin survived for approximately 32 minutes uh, before totally melting. And the students were very proud of themselves because they had taken a couple styrofoam cups and duct tape and created a igloo in which the uh, little ice cube penguin survived. That's awesome. 
And, and what grades were these? This was for first grade. We did this for K through five on one day across the whole district. Your presentation, is that something that we could maybe I could get a link to? I could throw in the show notes for people who want to learn more about what you presented on? Definitely. I can send you the link to the presentation. It's it's pretty bare bones, though, because I'm not one of those people who, you know, puts a presentation up just for the sake of having a presentation to read off of. Um, But I will definitely be able to provide any listeners with additional information if they would like some. Now, I'm going to deviate a little bit, but in in the same circles that we seem to be running in, our good mutual acquaintance, Glenn Robinson, is doing some amazing things with like one day special events. And he's doing the EdCamp style, which since I have you here, I'm going to get you both on at the same time. So this is, you're probably slated for like three appearances here, here in brief one on your own, and then we'll do one with Glenn and then Glenn gets his own. So that's good for creating more episodes of the podcast because you guys are dynamic individuals. So I'm just going to throw that out there and officially make sure that you're invited to appear at least two more times. Great. Anything we can do, both Glenn and I are big fans of you and your work. So anything we can do to help support what we're doing and what you're doing, we're all in. I'm just a guy letting people share their stories. As I'm speaking on Glenn's behalf also. And, and I'm sure he won't mind at all because he's, uh, he's good like that. <laughs> <laughs> so before we wrap up, would you attend Edscape again? And as an administrator, could you see yourself ever creating a conference? Could you see yourself doing that? Or have you ever thought about doing something like that? Well, first of all, yes, I will definitely be attending and hopefully have the opportunity to present again in the future at future uh, Edscape conferences. Uh, Like I said, it was a great opportunity to really just connect with some like-minded educators. And I took away a lot of ideas that I will definitely be implementing, not only in my own practice, but within the district to benefit our kids in the future. You know, as far as presenting or creating this own type of Edscape conference in the future, I eventually, yes, it is something I would like to do, probably with a very strong team um, of like-minded educators. However, um, right now, what I'm doing is I'm starting small, and we're doing that at the district level. So, for example, our recent October 12th in-service day, uh, all across the district, all but two of our workshops were presented by our own staff. And it was very empowering. And teachers had the opportunity to, some of them had the opportunity to select which workshops they wanted to go to. Some of them, it was more of a requirement. But we are moving towards that full Edscape model within the district for PD. And I think that that's something that I would like to expand upon in the future. I think that news like that and people like yourself who are going to do that in districts, That'll be well-received for teachers and other educators because if there's anything we hate as teachers, and hate's a strong word, we hate mandates and being told what to do. And how can the listeners get in touch with you? I can be reached via a few different outlets. My biggest outlet is, of course, Twitter, uh, where I can be reached at Mrs. D122. That's MRSD122 on Twitter. They can also read my blog curriculummatters.wordpress.com. And that's with one M in between curriculum and matters. In addition to that, they can also email me at curriculummatters at gmail.com. Awesome. Thank you so much for your feedback, Jill. I, I didn't get to attend Edscape. I had some family obligations that came up, but it's definitely on my agenda for next year already. Will I get to see you at EdCamp New Jersey coming up in November? Definitely. I already have my e-tickets ready to go. Awesome. Thank you so much for a few minutes, Jill. You're welcome anytime, Chris. Thank you very much, Jill. I really appreciate you again taking time to come here on the podcast. And I am looking forward to having you to come on to a future episode of the House of Ed Tech. And now, let's check out this episode's EdTech recommendation. I'd like to recommend to you the Overcast podcast app. Overcast is a powerful yet simple audio podcast player with features such as smart speed, voice boost, and smarter playlists to help you listen to more podcasts in more places, try out new shows, 
and completely control your podcast listening experience. Now, this app used to cost $4.99. It is now free. The reason it's free, the creator of the app found that about 80% of the users were not paying for the features that made the app so awesome. So he decided, I need to make this free so people can take advantage of the features that I put in, which was the reasons he created the app. Now, Overcast is a modern, fully featured audio podcast player. So if you do consume video podcasts, this isn't going to help you. You can download podcasts for playing anytime, anywhere, even when you're offline, so you don't have to stream them. You can download them, of course. You can search and browse for new podcasts. Plus, you can get recommendations from the people you follow on Twitter. And you can also, by sharing content, get more recommendations and share the favorite shows that you listen to. And people who use this app, who follow you on Twitter, will get to see what you like. You can create custom playlists with smart filters and per podcast priorities, and you can rearrange the lists whenever and however you want. You can also receive optional push notifications when new episodes arrive. This is a really good feature because the Apple podcast app doesn't give you push notifications, and I personally found that it really didn't update until you like manually went in and you know you swiped and you updated your podcasts. You can also subscribe to any podcast. You can just listen to an episode if you search for a show. You can try new shows without committing, which, you know, commitment could be a big deal, especially with a podcast. Or use the voice boost feature to enhance and normalize speech volume. So let's say, and I don't think my podcast does this because I think the volume is pretty good, but you might listen to some podcasts that are really loud, or you might listen to some podcasts that the audio is always just really quiet and you're constantly having to adjust the volume in your car or on your headphones. The Overcast app takes care of that for you. You can also adjust the playback speed. I actually have enabled the smart speed. Now what this does, it fluctuates over 1x. It doesn't go to 2x, but it does speed the podcasts up that you're listening to. And if you go into the settings, it will tell you how much time it has saved you by using their app. So far, I've been using it for about two weeks. And this week, the shows I listened to, I've saved about 35 minutes of time that I didn't know I was using to listen to podcasts just by using the smart speed feature. You can also control it with CarPlay if your car supports that. Overcast will also work well with your Apple Watch if you have one using the glance and notification features of the Apple Watch. Again, Overcast is free, and there actually is one more really cool feature. When you get the app, you also have access to use Overcast.fm, which is web-based, and you can be listening to a podcast in your car or on the go, and then if you find yourself in front of your computer, you can go to Overcast.fm, you log in, and then it's like multi-room DVR. Whatever show you were listening to, you could pick up, or really any shows you're listening to, you could pick up through your web browser, and you can just continue to listen. And of course, yes, there is one more other really cool feature. When you share content that you want to tweet something out, it will actually, in the tweet, put a link, and when people click it, it'll go to that minute and second in the podcast episode you're listening to, so you can share content that's really, you know, point on, accurate, however you want to put it. I really don't know what I'm saying. <laughs> um, that's Overcast the podcast app, check it out. If you wind up switching to it, let me know. Uh, if there's a podcast app that you also like, share that with me as well, or send me feedback other ways to let me know what you use and why you like it. And if you're a user of Overcast, let me know how you take advantage of these features and uh, how much time you've saved. And that's my EdTech recommendation for this episode. Now we can shift gears, and now we're going to move into the featured content, my conversation with the author of Ditch That Textbook, Matt Miller. And now, ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to bring in my featured guest for this episode. Today, we are talking to Matt Miller. He is a proud graduate of Indiana State University. He used to be a newspaper reporter, which we will dig into shortly. He's been a high school teacher since 2004 where he has taught Spanish, English. He's been a yearbook advisor. And really cool, 
He is also the founder of DitchThatTextbook.com and the author of the book of the same name. He's a blogger, speaker, husband, father of three, and we subscribe to the same philosophy of live in the dream. Welcome to the House of Ed Tech, finally, Matt Miller. Thank you very much, sir. It is it is nice and comfortable in here. I'm all dressed up in my brand new pinstripe suit for this interview, and I, I think I'm, I'm ready to go. I hope your listeners appreciate that I went out and got this. They should very much appreciate it, Matt, because you tweeted me directly. We call that a direct message in the ed tech world. And you said you had the suit. You've got the suit. I'm excited. Yeah, I know. I know. And and your your purple suit is looking pretty good, too, especially with the top hat and the cane that, that you've got going on. So I wish they could see that because it's it is you really make it work. As uh, Bruno Mars would say, I am styling, profiling, living it up in the city. That's what I was thinking, too. Yeah. <laughs> we first met face to face at ISTE this past summer, and that was phenomenal because in a weird sense, it, it, it was weird for me because I was excited to connect with you and you were excited to connect with me. And I forget yes. who had brought it up for us and was like, oh, you need to go find Matt Miller. He wants to meet you. And I was like, <laughs> what? So it, it was just really I've never been in that situation before. So <laughs> it, was, it was great to finally make that face to face connection and, you know, shake your hand and all that good stuff. Yeah, yeah, I feel I feel the same way. And I I was kind of amazed by the ISTE conference. If your listeners have never been to it and they get an opportunity to go, um, I I think it's a it's a great experience. This was my first one and it really did feel like my entire Twitter feed was just walking the halls of that convention center. And there were there were so many people that I've I've followed and whose whose work I respect and you're definitely on that list. And I um you know, I, I would just this this is kind of out of my personality a little bit, but I would just kind of wander up and say, "Hey, are you so and so?" And I just kind of start a conversation. I think that's kind of that's kind of where we ended up at ISTE too. So that's that's one of the neat things to to be able to do at that conference. I think. But see, now here's the difference: when I do that, nobody knows who I am because most of what you see of me is my avatar, and if you subscribe to the podcast, you see my face. With you, you walk up to somebody. You're wearing a bright yellow T-shirt that says "Ditch that textbook" on the front of it. A little yep, easier for right. you. That's right. That's right. Bald head, glasses, and bright yellow shirt. And I'm kind of a walking billboard at those kind of things. So it does make it a little bit easier to to try to connect me to to my work. So that's that's kind of done on purpose. And it should be. It, it's all about branding and image, and uh, and you pull it off very nicely. Well, thanks, thanks. It's you know that I. I know sometimes people in education give branding kind of a, a bad name, but I really think even even for people who are starting out in blogging, if people know what you stand for and if people know who you are, then they kind of know what to expect. And if you've got a message that you're passionate about, that you want to get out, um, that you want want people to be able to hear, then I think it, I think that's a good way to good way to deliver it. So, and that's why I have you here. It is is. To give you another platform to deliver that message, which I think is really awesome. So oh, thank you. Let's get into the nitty gritty hardball hitting part of being on the House of Ed Tech. So, Matt, where did the idea <laughs> where did the idea of ditch that textbook originally come from before it was a book before you buy a domain name? What's the history? OK, so I am a high school Spanish teacher, um, have been for 11 years and for the first, I'd say, three years or so of my teaching career, I was very traditional. Um, Actually, top real quick, Matt, I, I, yes. I don't mean to interrupt, but That's are you going to are you going to be willing to go back and do the whole interview again in Spanish so I can tell my listeners they can hit the SAP button on their podcast catcher? Yeah, I will do the whole <laughs> interview in Spanish again if you will ask all of the questions in Spanish. And you're going to have to be quick on Google Translate if you're going to make that happen. Tú necesitas tener cuidado porque tú no sabes que... Nosotros saben español. Oh, no me digas, hablas español. Perfecto. Cuatro <laughs> años en escuela secundaria y dos semest semestres. Mm -hmm. Yo no sé, dos semestres en uh, universidad. Ha, un episodio bilingüe de Casa de EdTech. Fenomenal. Sí, sí fen fenomenal, pero... Tú necesitas hablar más despacio para más mí. Más despacio, <laughs> lo siento. And, and for those listening, where I'm not putting the translation in the show notes. <laughs> so, M Mr. Miller, continue. 
Yes. Okay. So where was I? I think I remember. Uh, three years into my teaching career, I'm still very traditional. Um, teach with a textbook, lots of questions at the end of the chapter and workbook pages and worksheets and all of that stuff. And as I, as I get to that point, I start to have this horrible realization that my students in my Spanish classes can't speak Spanish which is a problem if you're a Spanish teacher. Um, it really, it really hit me. Um, one time when I was at a fellowship of Christian athletes, uh, meeting and I was one of the sponsors of that and they were playing a game and there were lots of challenges. And one of the challenges was just to say something in a foreign language and your team would get extra points. And so I'm looking out at everybody. I'm going, okay, you guys have got this. You guys are in Spanish class. You've got this. I was like, you know, I had been a teacher for four weeks at that point. And so we look out there and we're ready for answers. And it was like crickets, like nobody said anything. And my, my brand new teacher heart was starting to sink. And so we, we keep looking and this one little girl raises her hand and I'm thinking, Oh, finally we have somebody. And she says something in Hungarian, (laughs) not even kidding. I'm like, really? You couldn't say anything in Spanish. She's like, yeah, we did a mission trip and they taught us. Great. So that was that was one of the big things that that showed me that I needed to change. And so um, in the middle of a fascinating lecture on a uh, full full class period lecture on reflexive verbs or the imperfect tense or something like that, um, I kind of realized that things couldn't get any worse than they really than they already were. I had my students take their textbooks and stick them in these enormous wooden cabinets in the back of my room. And I don't recommend people do this, by the way, but I I just I knew that something had to change and it couldn't get any worse. And so that was that was the original textbook ditching for me was we put those away. And I'd like to say that it was sunshine and rainbows and puppy dogs after that. But it really wasn't. Um, It was sort of a mess. And I didn't really know what I was doing. But we started talking in Spanish more. We started finding authentic right resources online and creating things online. And eventually my kids were able to start just sort of spontaneously talking to me in Spanish. And I still, I still don't have all the answers for if I ditch my textbooks, how will this work? Or I still don't have all the answers for teaching uh, Spanish in a very non-traditional digital way, but it's a process. I, I think that's kind of where we all are as educators is we, we want to, take what we do and try and improve it day by day, year by year. And that's, that's all I'm trying to do. So I'm, I'm a little farther along in that process than I was back then. What are some of the technological tools that you've brought into the classroom over, over this period of time that kids are using to learn Spanish? My, my very first foray into the ed tech world, I think was my multimedia cart. I came up with that that word because I, I sort of put together a hodgepodge grouping of different things that included um, a VCR uh, a VCR player and a DVD player and some speakers and then the crown jewel of the uh, the multimedia cart was the LCD projector that I sort of lucked into because an English teacher across the hall had gotten one and he decided that he didn't want to take his notes that were on overhead transparencies and switch them over to PowerPoint because he was too close to retirement. And so he decided to pass that along to me. So that was kind of like early days of, of that. And I, I wasn't in a one-to-one situation. And honestly, I've never taught in a full one-to-one situation. This last year, my class had, um, a cart of Chromebooks. So they always stayed in the classroom. You know, it's gone from using some of the, back when I did use the textbooks, using some of the software that was provided with it uh, that we we were able to do just every once in a while to um, nowadays this last year. I mean, we were literally on Google apps and Google classroom and my class website pretty much every day, almost every day. And it wasn't because I felt like we had to use that technology every time, but it was, in my opinion, the best way to get the content across and to create the learning experiences that that students needed. And there were there have been times, there were times early on and there are times still where we'll close up those Chromebooks or we'll shut the technology down and we'll just have a conversation or we'll get out an old fashioned piece of paper and pencil. I know, shocking. And we'll actually 
draw something um, that has to do with the vocabulary list that we're working with or, or something like that. Um, I've got a couple of my students that, that joke with me that whenever we do that, that we're pulling out the, uh, the ancient educational artifacts whenever we use pencils and, and paper. And I, I kind of joke with them and I say, OK, back in the old days. This is how we used to write in classrooms. You see this this shiny white thing right here? This is paper. And it's a it's a relative of papyrus. And what we what we used to do with this was we used to put these these ancient scribblings on and I kind of go on and on about it and they they get a kick out of it. But we still do that every once in a while. I still consider myself to have a fairly paperless classroom, but sometimes there there are ways that that paper just gets it across better, I think, than, than technology. And I don't think that's a bad thing. No, that's not a bad thing at all. I mean, in fact, I think a couple episodes ago, I had recommended uh, just using a little notebook and a pen <laughs> as, as a way, <laughs> you know, <laughs> you know, taking it back to the old school. Sure. Totally agree with that. Yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm the same way whenever, whenever I have to take, um, whenever, I, whenever I have to brainstorm, I mean, I, I love, I love sketching on my iPad. I love taking notes in drive, but if I need to do a brain dump or if I really need to get my thoughts together, I still get out a sheet of paper and I still do a mind map or a list or something. In fact, um, I still have, I mean, like within inches from where I'm sitting, I still have a couple of the, the papers that I charted out my book on with all of the original lists and the, the word webs and all of that stuff. And that's, that's how I organized my book when I wrote my book. So, and, and I think there's, there's also something to be said about the tactile um, advantages of doing that. I mean, there's something, there's something about holding a book in your hand or about using a, a piece of paper and actually putting pen to paper and the feeling in that, or like the feeling of freshly um, sanded wood and, you know, j- just some of those, those materials we, we can't get digitally. And so I think whenever somebody says, I want to go totally digital, I don't want to use a single scrap of paper in my class. I just want to do everything on the devices. I think you're sort of missing out sometimes on the really great experiences of life. There's, there's nothing quite like, you know, going out and taking a walk in the woods or walking through a beautiful state park or, you know, going and swimming in a pond or something. I mean, I'm, I kind of live out in the country and so we still do those kinds of things, you know, but, um, you know, I think we, whenever we remove all of those away from the classroom, totally, I think we're denying our kids of certain experiences that, that they should be able to have. And then some of those are the experiences that are really in their wheelhouse, something that they're, they're really good with. And if we take that away 100%, I, I just, I just think that's, that's not the way to go. I I agree a thousand percent because the same way that in a lot of situations in a lot of districts where we say we're shortchanging the kids because they don't have access to technology and certain things. If you go completely to technology, yes, then we're shortchanging them in the other direction too. Yes. Yes, absolutely. I, I'm the ditch that textbook guy. And I know that I just said a second ago, there's something about holding a book in your hand. And I mean, I, and my, my philosophy on ditch that textbook isn't that I hate textbooks or that textbooks are not, are not the way to go, but that I think that in, in this age in 2015 and beyond, I think we can do better than just bringing kids into a textbook and reading activities and things out of the book and doing questions. I think that that's, that's another example of that is it's another way to get kids outside of that textbook because I mean, life isn't done through a textbook. Life isn't done through a set of multiple choice questions that can be, you know, graded and analyzed and, I think whenever we get too too focused on that, we we get kids away from what what real life really is. And that's what we're all about anyway. It's how are we preparing these kids when they leave our classroom, when they graduate, whether it's workforce, whether it's college, university, you know, how can we best prepare them? And we have to prepare them by creating the most well-rounded student possible. So if that's yeah. using a textbook or using an iPad or, you know, making a physical collage, we have to expose them to as much as we can. 
Let's see. I've I've heard this I've heard this statement attributed to a couple of different people. Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna connect it to Michelle Baldwin because she has it in her Twitter profile. But um, Michelle Baldwin is someone that I've followed on Twitter for a while, and she says something to the effect of, "If we prepare kids for, yeah, I'm gonna totally butcher this, but it's something like if we prepare kids for today, or if we prepare kids for our future, then we're robbing them of their own tomorrow." And I think that we have to we have to remember we have to remember that that their their future is going to look a lot different than ours. And we have to remember that the tools that we need to equip them and the skills that we need to equip them with are different than what we have. And we've got to we've got to continue to to look forward to that and and be flexible. I think that just tied into the conversation we were having. I hope that wasn't a total rabbit trail. No, I, I'm I am with you. And uh, if we're falling down the hole, we're going together. <laughs> yes. All right. All right. Sounds good. Now, I want to shift gears a little bit, but it's along the same lines, but I want to get your perspective on a different perspective. <laughs> okay. I just put another perspective on a different perspective. I think I can do that. Okay. The student experience in your classroom, what would your students say about Mr. Miller based on everything you just said you believe in and how you construct it? What is the feedback you get from your students over these last years of you having this mentality what would kids say about the experience in my class or what's the feedback that i've gotten i know that some kids have said that they feel like whenever i give them opportunities to engage in things online and create things online that it's kind of playing to their strengths that they're used to those tools they're familiar with them and i'm just kind of giving them an opportunity to use those, but in an academic setting. I've heard some of them tell me that they feel like the, the things that we're doing are preparing them for the, for the future. We do a lot of storytelling whenever I teach Spanish. Um, we'll take the vocabulary or the grammar concepts or whatever that we're learning and tie them into stories, just kind of goofy stories. A lot of times that we come up with off the top of our heads where the kids are the stars of the stories. And so I'll pull them in and they'll be the main characters. And so whenever we do that, it's fun. And it's almost like it's, it's one of those magical moments where you look up at the clock and there's only two minutes left in class and you think you've only been there for 15 minutes. It's that, that sort of state of flow that you get into whenever something is, is going and it's, and it's going right. And I know a lot of, a lot of teachers are able to reach that too. And um, for me, whenever I can just, make it an enjoyable experience, just have fun within the confines of the, of the, um, lesson that we're doing. I think, you know, those are, those are some of the things where, where we're at our best in my class. Well, so far through this conversation, I've totally seen more than I had seen before about you as an educator. So in my mind, you're on that list now in my head of, if I ever start a school or someone says, Hey, I'm going to start a school and we need teachers. You're, you, we have to work together one day somehow in, in a school. Okay. <laughs> that, that sounds awesome. I would totally even come out there to New Jersey. In fact, if you can talk my wife into it, I'll be, I'll be game for it. But we live like 15 minutes away from all of her family. And I, I don't think that's happening, but you can try. I, I, I can't argue with that. I, the house I bought in the actual house of ed tech now is two blocks from my mother-in-law. Awesome. I think that's awesome, isn't it? We have a good relationship. I, 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 okay. I have nothing bad to say. Okay. Yeah. See, see, I'm the same way. I think it's, and I'm a half an hour from my parents and less than 15 minutes from all of them. So yeah, it's good. Sorry. I think my mind's going about a hundred different directions here, but yeah. How did we get to in-laws in this conversation? I love how this, this conversation is taking all these different, all these different uh, routes that we didn't expect. That's the joy of conversation. No. Yeah. Yeah. Totally agree. Totally agree. What excites you about education over the next, say, one to two years? Oh, my goodness. That's a that's a great question. And th- this is just me being totally honest, and I'm not I'm not sure exactly how this is going to sound. So I hope that, <laughs> that this isn't insulting in any way. I don't think it, it will be. But whenever I go out to uh, conferences, whenever I present at conferences or do trainings at schools and that kind of thing, um, I talk to teachers a lot of times about the kinds of stuff that I'm doing in my class that 
is really changing the game for us, that we're able to be more efficient with Google Apps or that we're able to get the perspectives and experiences of people um, from different states or countries through Google Hangouts and Skype and that we're able to create things and publish them for people to see and all of that. I, I always have to remind myself that not everybody is at that level yet and that that's all st- still sort of new for – I'd almost say for the, the majority of the teaching population that that's all still pretty new. And the thing that excites me about the next year or two or three is that that stuff is starting to become more mainstream. And when that stuff becomes more mainstream, then more kids are going to get those opportunities and experiences and we're going to start to see – I'm hoping that we're going to start to see classrooms change and we're going to start to see minds change and teaching practices changed. And I, I see that as the opportunity that, that we have ahead of us. And the, the other thing I think is that technology is always changing, uh, teaching practices, the things that we know about teaching practices are always changing. And it seems like it's changing now, probably faster than it ever has in history. I really think this is an exciting time to be an educator. It's it's only going to get better, I think, just because of the opportunities and the tools that we have at our disposal. And so I'm just really excited to see where that all goes and how it all plays out. Not to – I'm not going to – I'm not sucking up to you, but based <laughs> on what you see, it's because of people like you and your website and your book that are having an impact in making those things happen and making it a reality – for teachers in this country and probably all over the world, because I'm sure your book is available wherever people buy books. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Pre- pretty much. Yeah. But no, I think you're exactly right. And there are, I mean, there really are so many amazing educators out there. And I think that whenever we all step up to the, the proverbial microphone and lend our voice and share what we know and share what we think and have those discussions more and more people find out about it and it just spreads. And I think, you know, I'm, I'm no different than anybody else in that way that I just have my own experiences and the things that I've learned that I want to share with everybody else. And I think the more that we do that, the more it takes off and, you know, it kind of, kind of goes exponentially from there. And I think that's, that's really how we change education is it, it happens. I think one teacher, one classroom at a time and continuing to get the message out about what works and what's good um, so that we all have that same collective knowledge. And we have such great avenues to do that through, through social media and technology and the web. And so I think, I think we're, we're in really good shape and hopefully you're continuing to get better. And you are in good shape, Matt, because you have I'm, – I'm looking at it here on Skype. You have the ATR 2100. You could take your message <laughs> to the next level. <laughs> to the next level, you think so, huh? I don't see why that. I don't know if you would call it "ditch that podcast." But <laughs> <laughs> that, that, I think that hurts the branding. But <laughs> yeah, that's probably right. That's true. The ditch thing only only works for for certain things. So, yeah, no. Um, actually, I I don't know if I'm allowed to to plug this here on the show, but I'm going to do it anyway, and plug you can away. edit it out plug if away. you don't want to. <laughs> plug away. But, um, I have a a good friend who's an educator. A uh, second grade teacher in South Carolina named Jed Deeryberry, and together the two of us actually have started a podcast on the BAM Radio Network called Hooked, and it's all about engaging um, students, uh, hooking them into your lessons. And we've had, um, you know, we've had we've had Dave Burgess, the author of Teach Like a Pirate. We've had, I think two national teachers of the year and a couple of state teachers of the year and um, just some some other teachers that some people don't know about that are doing amazing things in their class too. And um, so, yeah, that's, that is a space that I'm, I'm starting to jump out into that I'm having an awful lot of fun in. And I mean, you can, you can see that fun too. And um, I, I heard you saying on a, on a recent episode, um, this conversation you had at, at ISTE about how, uh, podcasting may just really take off here in the next few years. And I can, I can totally see why I've been bought into it for a few years now. And it's, it's just, it's so neat that you can kind of listen to these, these messages that are custom tailored to you and then turn around and go make one on your own, you know? Absolutely. And you were, I, I think you were there for that conversation. No, when we were sitting I on was, the floor. Yes. 
Yeah. Yes, I was. I was there. I was in the little powwow that we had there on the on the floor at the Philadelphia Convention Center, and it was it was amazing, as you said. I got I, and I got to reiterate that was the best part of ISTE was just sitting on the floor playing Duck Duck podcast. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. And just and Angela Watts was there. She's she's the one who said it that. You know, years ago it was that's how the makerspace conversation started. Yes. And now look yes. at makerspaces. So I'm gonna go with Angela and I'm gonna say, mm-hmm. you know, three, four, five years out, podcasting mm-hmm. is gonna be huge at a place like ISTE. Yeah. You know, I had a conversation recently with um sort of a big voice in the ed tech and education world who told me that um that this person believes that podcasting will in the in the next couple of years will sort of revolutionize the way that people listen to messages especially in their car and you know it it's going to give us an opportunity to really use the those times to you know to learn and to develop and actually put something meaningful into our brain during that time and i i i see it taking off like crazy too so we're we're all in that same – we're keep talking about boats tonight. We're all in that same podcast. <laughs> Maybe and, pirate ship. And, and the nice thing is though, as much as I learn from podcasts, I do have a couple of guilty pleasure podcasts that I can just kind of veg out on and it's a nice thing. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I know. I've My uh, my list of podcasts is, is sort of starting to grow here and obviously the House of Ed Tech is in it and – um I just recently started listening to the uh, Cult of Pedagogy. In fact, I think I, I think yesterday and today were were the first couple of them that I listened to, and I I really really like that. I love Angela Watson's, and um, yeah, I've got a whole bunch of them in here: Tech Educator and Principally Speaking, and yeah, there are all sorts of really good ones out there, aren't there? I you again, I'm the choir. I, I everything you just said, I also listen to. Jennifer Gonzalez does a great job. I love Angela yes, Watson. Does. Um, Jason, oh God, Mr. Bodner, shout out to you. Love you. Oh yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Fellow Hoosier there. He's a good friend of mine and he is, he, his, his podcast has really taken off. It's been fun to listen to that from where it started until where it is right now. And he's, he's doing a phenomenal job. Yes. I, 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 I love Jason Bodner's show. I listen to it every week. That's me, me too. And down. I'm not yeah. even, I'm not even an administrator. I'm not a principal and I get so much out of it. He has great Great guest, and I think he asks asks really insightful questions. So there you yeah, go, Jason. Yeah. Big shout out to you. E- even for myself, I, I don't really have any true aspirations to become an administrator. But again, good, compelling content is good, compelling content, and I enjoy it. Yes. So there you go. Yes, yes, totally agree. <laughs> all right, Matt, we have gone all over the uh, the spectrum here to, here today. Yes. Um, so let's close it out, and before we let you go let everybody know where they can find you, how they can connect with you and how they can continue to learn from you. All right. Be glad to. Um, so the best place to, to find what I do is at ditch that textbook.com. And I will say one of the first things people will see when they get there is there's a free ebook there called 101 practical ways to ditch that textbook. And, um, that's, that's just a, a list with lots of little summaries and, um, you know, screenshots and icons and all of that of ways to get your class outside of the textbook, bring in creativity and technology and engagement and all of that stuff. And so that's available for free. That's different than the book. Um, But I blog twice a week on that about technology and creative teaching and all of that. And so that's the best place right there. I am very active on Twitter. Uh, You can find me at J Matt Miller. That's the letter J Matt with two T's and then Miller. Um, so definitely, you know, go check me out there. I'm also on a number of different social media and, you know, my email I'm on all the time. So I'm always, I'm always willing to answer questions or engage with people on a more personal, deeper level there. So, um, you know, aside from just handing out my cell phone number here on air, I think <laughs> they're, they're right. There are lots of ways that, that people could get a hold of me. Matt, thank you so much for coming here on the House of Ed Tech. The suit looked great. The conversation was great, and uh, and you are great. So thank you for being here. Hey, likewise. I feel the same way. And purple is definitely your color, Chris.
Thanks again, Matt. And the purple suit will now be put away until the next time you come to the House of Ed Tech. And now, before we go, let's uh, meet this episode's House of Ed Tech VIP. Congratulations to Mr. Glenn Robbins. Glenn Robbins is the lead learner at the Northfield Community Middle School near Atlantic City, New Jersey. Glenn is a husband and father, and he's a crazy man because he is also a doctoral student. He's the organizer of ed camps, and he was also involved with the planning of the NJPA ESET 2 conference. Most recently here in 2015, he was the Middle School Educators Voice Award winner for Principal of the Year through the BAMI Awards. He's also, and this is really, really fresh and recent, he is the creator and the originator of the ed camp period at his school. What Glenn is doing is pretty much on a daily basis or really on a regular basis, he is implementing an ed camp period for his students where his students get to choose what they want to learn the same way you go to an ed camp and choose what you want to learn for professional development. He's giving kids the same opportunity. It is unbelievable what he's doing at Northfield Community Middle School. You need to learn more about it. You need to connect with Glenn. I'm connected to Glenn, and you should too. He's on Twitter. He is GlennR1809, which is G-L-E-N-N-R-1809, and that's on Twitter. And he blogs at connectedleadlearner.blogspot.com. Check out his blog. He posts on a regular basis, and right now all his posts are geared towards how awesome this ed camp period is. Congratulations, Glenn. You are a House of Ed Tech VIP. And that is going to do it for this episode of the House of Ed Tech. Thank you again to Jill Dobrowanski for sharing your thoughts in the EdTech Thought segment about your Edscape experience. Thank you to Matt Miller for taking time to have a conversation and share more about Ditch That Textbook and the way you're making a difference in education. And thank you to Glenn Robbins for being Glenn Robbins, which makes you the House of EdTech VIP. Keep the conversation going. Go visit the website, chrisnessy.com. Over there, you can view the show notes for this episode, number 47. I would love for you to share your thoughts on the information and resources that I shared in this episode. You can do that by leaving a comment on the show notes, or you can email me directly, feedback at chrisnessy.com. And you can also submit audio feedback. You can call the House of Ed Tech listener feedback line. And that number, as always, is 732-903-4869. You can connect on Voxer, on Mr. Nessie. That's a great quick way to get audio. And you can also connect with me on Twitter, where I am, of course, Mr. Nessie, N-E-S-I, and just use the hashtag House of Ed Tech. Now, if you enjoy the House of Ed Tech, go tell somebody else. Tell another teacher, tweet about it, share the show notes. That's the best way you can help spread the word and let people know how awesome the podcast is. And that'll let me know that you really appreciate what I'm doing here. Another way you can help out is you can rate and review the podcast on iTunes. A five-star rating, if you feel I'm worthy of that, and a positive review helps to keep the show front and center in the categories that I'm listed in, which is education, K-12, education technology, and then people can discover and enjoy the podcast. You can also support the show through patreon.com, and you can go over to patreon.com slash House of Ed Tech. Now, through Patreon, you can actually lend some financial support to the show. So you can donate it as little as a dollar an episode, or you can go crazy. I'm not going to stop you. And again, that's patreon.com slash House of Ed Tech. On the next episode of the House of Ed Tech, I'm going to be speaking with... That's going to be a surprise, so you will have to check out episode number 48, which will come out on November 8th, 2015. Once again, thank you for listening. I truly appreciate it. And remember, using technology isn't difficult. Just give it a try.
He's a blogger, speaker, husband of dad, and live in the dream. Wait, what did I just say? Husband you said I'm a dad. husband of dad. I don't know what that is. <laughs> Let's see. We'll try that again. Yeah. Now, when you were out with your mom, did she check your crotch in the jeans and make sure everything was going to be good for this first day of school outfit? I have no comment on that on that question. The House of Ed Tech is a proud member of the Education Podcast Network. The Education Podcast Network. Podcasts for educators. Podcasts by educators. For more, go to edupodcastnetwork.com.